Welcome to the Master Circle. We are so glad that you're here with us today. The Master Circle is your home base, go-to monthly session where you can get expert insight and ideas about all things fundraising. Have you got a burning question? Maybe a special challenge? Access to great fundraising practices, techniques, and tools is what we are all about. So if you're fundraising for a cause and want to really get great traction, well, you happen to be in the right place. Here's how it works. The Master Circle is innovative fundraising techniques that are actually driven by you, your questions, what you want to know about fundraising. Every month we collect and respond to questions from our audience and we really dig into the topics that you suggest. Now the Master Circle is brought to you by Mosaic Nonprofit Development. We're a fundraising education firm focused on creating effective and sustainable fundraising initiatives for nonprofits. We happen to work hand in hand with the leadership, professionals, volunteers and investors of NGOs around the globe to help them develop strategies and implement solutions that increase resources and enable mission achievement. We are nonprofit, uh, Mosaic Nonprofit Development, leading innovation in fundraising education. One of the ways Mosaic helps you get really effective fundraising for your results for your nonprofit is through our online courses, like today's live Master Circle session, our workshops, and we actually work one-on-one -on -one with fundraising coaching, where we work with you very specifically to focus on what's really going to advance your cause. So I happen to be Heidi Hancock. I'm here with Mosaic, ready to focus on helping causes get wildly successful with fundraising. Now, we really do like that wildly uh, successful idea here at Mosaic. So we tend to not stay on the edges or in the center, but we move towards the fringe to find things that are going to get you traction. I happen to be a certified fundraising executive. I've raised over $70 million for causes all around the world. And I really love working with folks on a global basis to help them get resources for their cause so that they can achieve their mission. So David, tell us a little bit about you. Thanks, Heidi. I'm David Svet. I handle marketing communications here at Mosaic. I have more than 25 years of experience in the marketing communications for the nonprofit sector. I'm coming to you today from beautiful Kansas City, smack dab in the middle of the United States, while Heidi is on her beautiful island getaway off the coast of Boston. <laughs> and we've got some really exciting stuff for you here today. It is a cool session today, David. We've had all kinds of requests from folks with questions about how to keep on top of everything that goes into a successful fundraising operation. And I have to tell you, when those questions come through, I really feel for you. I can tell you from being in the trenches um, as a staff member in building everything from a one-person uh, shop to managing a department of 20 uh, fundraising uh, staff people plus all of the different um, committees that go with it, that that. Um, there's all kinds of different things that can happen to you where you lose your sanity, right? <laughs> As you're trying to manage your fundraising operations or grow it. Um, and so I'm really excited about what we're going to be sharing today. We're really digging deep um, into secret things that you can do behind the scenes to keep your sanity, motivate millions, and make it seem effortless. So today's session is the fundraising superhero because you know what, guys? We are all secret superheroes when it comes to fundraising. And we are managing time and priorities. Now, the master circle is very cool because you can ask your questions any time that they hit. So for today's topic, we've got some questions that were sent in, and we'll also be answering your questions along the way as we go. So we've got a little bit of housekeeping we want you to know about first. First thing, check it out. You have your participation today in the master circle is one good for one CEU, that is continuing education unit point towards your CFRE, your Certified Fundraising Executive Certification, or renewal. So make sure that you make a note on your calendar or be sure to put it in um, the date of today's session in your tracker. And on other coolness, I do want you to know that we are recording this session and it's kind of touch and go sometimes, but if everything goes well with all of the technology gods, we'll make sure to make this recording available to you so that you can really come back and take things in um, as they go. Two, seven. Great. So while you're typing, um, and uh, let us know, uh, it, you know, of course, that you can see, but let me know where you're logging in from, what city, what country. We, we tend to pull folks from all over the world, so it's always fun to, to figure out what kind of time zones that we're dealing with, but also great um, questions. So um, go ahead and let me know where it is that you're coming in from. That's our, our second one. So great. We got Baltimore, Maryland. Excellent. Vancouver, BC. Woohoo! 
Excellent. So that's a great new time frame. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, so Beth Ann is uh, logging in from Vancouver. Has the have the seasons changed so far yet? Are you into a cooler season? Is fall and the t the um, the, the leaves have changed yet, so we're we're kind of starting it down here in Boston, and uh, but uh, not quite yet. Washington D.C. Great, we've got a lot of East Coasters with uh, coming in. Thank you, Kia. Great, Katie, Beth Ann. Ah, we aren't cold like Boz, uh, like Boston, New York, or Washington. Okay, great, Beth Ann. So you're like Seattle, fantastic. And Dave, I see. It's great to see you here, Dave. Uh, I happen to know that Dave is just up the road from us. Um, here in the water uh, in Boston, so that's great to have you here. Okay, fantastic. So we've got a good collection, and um, and we've got Ingrid here, yes, from South Africa. Fantastic. So we're we're really bumping some time frames here um, today. Yep. Okay. And then we've got Josh. Josh is logging in from. Well, there you go, from Paris. Excellent. So fantastic. Great. That's I think that's a pretty close time frame to what's going on in South Africa too. So. We're all over the globe. It's fantastic. Great. All right. Now, so now we know where the, the chat box is and the questions are. Um, here's the second question for you. And this one is a real doozy. Are you ready? So today's Master Circle is session is on the fundraising superhero. And we want to know what is that one thing, that super special thing in today's session that's really important that you get out of, out of our session today. The one thing that you really want to walk away knowing, so that's going to make this the most valuable session for you today, because I know managing a fundraising organization um, is a lot of work. So let us know what that specific uh, question is, and we will certainly make sure that we cover it. So take a moment, think about it. Now, of course, as you're thinking about questions, if you've got the one thing that's really important that you want to walk away knowing today has to do with our um, today's topic, or it can certainly be on something that's completely unrelated to today's topic. But I would suggest that you want to keep it in the fundraising realm because, you know, questions about the best wetsuit that transitions from Hawaii to Boston is probably not going to fit the bill today. I'm happy to take those questions offline, though. That is something that I'm, I'm happy to help with. So, okay, so Kia lets us know she's interested in tools, um, calendars, and programs that's most helpful to, for keeping you as an individual manager on track uh, or individual fundraiser. Great. Okay, so we're really going to be talking through special things, you know, uh, effectiveness um, ways to build that up from here. So that's great, Kia. Okay, and then Beth Ann wants to know. Uh, okay, so Beth Ann's dealing with multiple regions, um, and so <laughs> so the wolves are at her door because she's got many people to make happy. So um, we're talking about happiness factor, especially when you're jumping uh, jumping regions. That's a uh, region regions. That's a great question, Beth Ann. Fantastic. So okay, guys, think about that one special thing that you really really want to know today. Um, and I want you to keep that chat box open because we're about to get uh, to get launched. So, David, why don't you go ahead and uh, let's get this show on the road. Oh, my. <laughs> well, that's strange. David, what in the world is that? This is an interesting way to lead off, uh, lead off our session on superheroes. What does that have to do with superheroes fundraising or what is it? <laughs> this is one of the most exciting critters I've ever found, Heidi. Um, <laughs> first of all, it's called a water bear. And if nothing else, just being called a water bear makes it the coolest critter on earth. Uh, but it's a superhero because this thing uh, is living in all of our backyards. It also lives at the bottom of the ocean next to thermal vents that are kicking out 300 degree Fahrenheit water. And it can live in outer space. <laughs> no way. Way. I, I, truly. Um, this thing uh, is able to uh, dehydrate itself and go into uh, an inanimate hibernation mode. And then when it gets back into an oxygen rich environment, it rehydrates and reanimates itself. So if you wanted to get life on a different planet, you could shoot these little guys into outer space. And if they landed on other planets, you're going to get them. And we would have water bears. Pretty darn cool. Okay, so as a fundraiser, so I'm kind of interested in being shot into outer space to see if I can actually, you know, revive and fundraise from outer space. But tell me, what does this have to do with our fundraising session today? Well, um, what we're talking about today is um, superheroes. And, and this is one of the most amazing superheroes out there. And I'm just very, very impressed with this one and how it's able to uh, 
to get us kicked off. I mean, it, it, they're tiny. It's it's less than half a millimeter long. Um, but boy, howdy, uh, they are amazing. So let's take a look at some of the things we're going to do today. Excellent. So in, so now that we've done, we've found that perhaps looking like a superhero with the different superpowers doesn't necessarily look the way that you expect it. But these are the things that we're going to be covering behind the scenes so that you can not only keep your sanity wearing your super cape, it doesn't have to be a secret, um, but reach your fundraising goals. You're, we're going to help you get those ducks in a row and your fundraising headed in the right direction. So some of the ways that we're going to, things that we're going to cover today is being successful um, with personal and project time management techniques, so special things that you can do on a personal basis and also on a project basis to actually manage what it is that you're doing, and ways to get it all done in the time frame that you have available. I know that urgency is a big thing for us in fundraising, and the, there's always not enough time. There's always more to do, so we'll help you manage those things so that you can set those things to be successful. We're going to actually take a look at setting fundraising goals and priorities. Um, oftentimes, goals and priorities seem, seem to compete, and of course, everything is extremely urgent and has to get done, and we spend a lot of time um, sometimes in the nonprofit sector functioning in crisis mode, so we'll help you set those priorities, even if you've got competing ones, um, to making them achievable, whether you're working as an individual or an, on an organization's fundraising goals. And then we're al also going to dig into some effective fundraising office management um, techniques. So whether you're managing a team, a system, an operation, and you know, David and I have actually spent a little bit of time, we've actually got a really bad pun for you for that one particular one when you're managing that office. So <laughs> let's get going here. Let's find out about our fundraising superheroes and get started, David. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Hmm. So, this looks like an octopus or a starfish or we're back under the sea. Yes, we what are under the this? sea. This is an octopus. You had it right. Um, and most octopi are able to change their color or the texture of their skin to match their surroundings. But this is no ordinary octopus. This is called a mimic octopus. And not only can it change color and texture, but it can do a superhero morph into a completely different shape so that it looks like a, a completely different sea creature. It's a mighty morphin octopus. So it's take a look. Octopus. It's, it is. I mean, take a look at here. Um, on, this is all the same octopus. On the left, it's still uh, looking like uh, a starfish. So it's, it's man managed to squish its head in uh, from being an octopus. And then on the right, it, it, it looks like a lionfish, a uh, poisonous lionfish. So wow. all, all the same guy. Pretty, pretty crazy. Um, and a lionfish, of course, is a toxic sea creature, so it, that's how it keeps from being eaten. So not only does it wear many hats, but it also wears many coats, many capes, and it is quite the superhero beast. And believe it or not, that takes us to our first question on how to be a superhero. <laughs> Tina L. asks, uh, I'm a fir the first paid staff person at my organization. And as a new executive director, I'm responsible for orchestrating all of the strategic priorities and making sure we're on track. Uh, but where will I find the time for fundraising with all the other things that have to be done? Uh, not to mention managing the board. Oh, yes. Uh, so just like our clothes horse octopus, uh, Tina is wearing many, many capes, trying to be a nonprofit superhero. Heidi, uh, what, what can we do to help her out? Uh, Tina, you certainly are. Uh, you are a superhero because you've taken up that task and you're leading the organization, especially as the first paid staff member. So you're trailblazing um, as well. And, and um, some of the things that you're doing are going to be setting the expectations um, for everybody that's involved with the organization in how, how they can interact and how they can move forward. So you've got a great opportunity, and I know it's a fantastic um Responsibility. So some of the things that you want to kind of keep an eye on, especially for first time or first um, first staff members, as you said, as the executive director, you're leading the entire organization. So you've got to be able to manage all of the strategic priorities and at the same time be able to delegate and manage those um, pieces, especially in fundraising, out to the board and to your volunteers. So one of the things that oftentimes happens with first time um, or first trailblazers or first paid staff members and it doesn't necessarily it's not just limited to an executive director um, it can be first development officer it can be first pretty much um, anything but because you are blazing that way um, you can be either projected onto as the savior um, someone who now that um, we've released the responsibility of the organization to this 
fantastic leader and they are totally in charge. And sometimes, um, even if we are, of course, we oftentimes start out as completely and totally reasonable people when we head down this road. Um, but that kind of reinforced message that comes back to you when people talk to you, when they kind of look at you with a blank look in their eyes as far as tell me what to do or what am I supposed to do or thank God you're here, you're going to take care of everything, um, that tends to reinforce that um, perception for yourself. And, and we, excuse me, we find that we end up um, starting to, to believe that we are responsible for everything. So the first thing that you want to do is just to kind of take a quick assessment and put some, um, excuse me, I'm going to really cough. Put some structures in place so that you, um, when you are taking on those things, that you do have a good team that you're building it up. Now, the trap is, again, because oftentimes when you're a, a first paid staff person, there's so much to be done. It's much easier to do it all yourself than to either train somebody or fill them in on what it is that they need to, to do. So take a moment to really, one, put as a priority into your your process is delegate and what I would do oftentimes if I was building up a department um, is I would just put that big word and I would smack you know tape it right across the um, front of my screen so that I was constantly reminded that at at that first moment of whatever's coming in my door that I make that quick assessment as to is this something that I can handle or I have to handle myself or is this something that's actually going to strengthen the organization by bringing someone else in now the funny thing um, that you want to want to think about too about delegating, um, building a little bit of extra time again because that's more communications um, that you want to do um, in order to bring people up to um, up to staff, but um, up to the process and what it is that you're doing. So between adding a little bit of time and making sure that you're constantly, you almost ask yourself that question every time that you, you are asked for something, to do something, or if you're thinking about strategy, strategy is also a really good one. You don't delegate the strategy, but you also involve people in, in the strategy uh, communication. So again, take a quick assessment, put your first priority down to delegate. Now remember, um, you can delegate to anybody. You're not limited to people who are involved in your organization. So you've got all kinds of resources that are at your fingertips. Of course, um, in a new organization, you're going to have a board. Um, and that oftentimes is the first place that we look. And sometimes we're going to get a little bit of pushback because now that they've got paid staff, people are like, yeah, that's your job, right? Um, so again, building that time to educate and um, and break that down. And then talking with board members um, if you're retraining them to accept delegation, you may want to give them a smaller task or a little piece of this or specifically ask them to um, act as a sounding board. Those are great ways to get engagement and to start to change that mentality that you are the one that's responsible for doing everything. Um, so working with board members is your, it can be your first line of defense, but don't limit it to that either. Remember, you've got folks that you can contract, um, especially if you're the first paid staff person. You're not going to be an expert on everything, and you shouldn't be. Um, that's kind of another another trap that we fall into is that we are, especially people who are first in, um, we tend to think of, I mean, one, we're going to be great generalists. We are going to be very facile and able to do a lot of different things. Um, but the time that it takes to actually ramp up to becoming an expert in an area is is much longer than it is to simply, again, co-opt somebody else's expertise. Um, so think about contracting, um, which also helps build your budget and build that build that perception of what's being done is valuable. Um, you can also, whether there are actually it's a paid contract or not, you can also delegate up. So if, if there's somebody um, in your uh, group of uh, contacts or communications folks that either you or the people that are involved with your organization know would be an expert in that area, have an interview, use them as a sounding board, ask their advice. And that's a great way, again, to engage and to co-opt um, delegations. Don't forget you've got volunteers, right? And donors are volunteers. So um, oftentimes, especially if you're first in uh, and you're building a program or you're building a, a process or building an organization, um, look to volunteers. You can even just recruit volunteers um, for new new particular things. So volunteers um, oftentimes are looking for higher level um, things that they can do, and delegating is a great thing to do um, with volunteers. And of course, if you do have staff, um, Absolutely, delegate um, delegate the staff, and you're not necessarily limited just to your development or fundraising staff. Your program staff um, certainly have a, an important role to play um, in fundraising as well as your communications 
staff. So you're going to be co-opting um, different pieces from different people all over. And again, think about delegating them first. And again, so don't forget, <clears throat> don't limit yourself to thinking about what's at your fingertips or, or the people who are already involved with your organization. Um, you've got board, you're going to retrain them, you've got volunteers, you can certainly recruit, you've got contract possibilities, so you can actually um, contract staff, whether they're a volunteer contract in expertise or um, a paid contract, that's a great way to do that. And also your staff, you're going to co-opt outside of the regular way that you're thinking. And the big caveat about delegation, just make sure that you build in the extra time a little bit to manage those delegations. Good point, Heidi. Um, if you're a leader, you need to have followers, and your job is going to be coordinating those followers as a leader, no matter how small your organization is. Mm -hmm. And speaking of small, check this guy out. <laughs> so that's one um, tiny frog, or well, <laughs> or is it a toad, David? No, that, Which one is it? I hope it raised more than a penny. I mean, come on, we're talking about fundraising here, right? Yes. What's up with the amphibian? He, he can raise more than a penny. That is a superhero frog. Uh -huh. uh, it's another one of our animals with enviable superpowers. Um, this is the seemingly innocent wood frog. Um, persona is about as boring as Clark Kent. Uh, lives in North America, uh, around us, all the way up to the Arctic Circle, though. And most of its days are spent doing frog things, uh, jumping and climbing. And so nothing too superhero -y here. Until... <laughs> it starts to get wintry out like it is now, particularly up around the Arctic Circle. And at the first sign of freezing, when its skin starts to tingle a little bit, this guy is able to turn its cells into ice. So it becomes this syrup-like liquid inside their cells. It actually stays viscous, but they, they become frozen in the wintertime and, and live uh, kind of like the... Uh, the water bear does uh, in outer space, but these guys go into a, a super hibernation mode where they are, they're actually frozen. And then when it get, comes springtime and the ice melts, takes them about 30 minutes to uh, get everything going again and, and they're back at it. Wow. It's pretty wild. Super frog. Yes. <laughs> One seriously adaptable animal. And that brings us to our next question. Uh, Amy R. asks us, uh, let's see, Amy says, I am fairly new to the nonprofit sector, okay, and I'm excited about making a difference, okay, she's a go-getter. Uh, it seems like there's too much to do and not enough time or resources, we've heard that before. <laughs> uh, are there any tips or techniques you can share that will help me get it all done? Uh, uh, Amy, yes, the eternal question in the nonprofit sector, too much to do, not enough time, well, I want to let you know when we hear we hear what it is that you're saying, and I want to assure you that that will never change, right? That's one of the fan, um, fantastic things about this uh, this work that it is that we do, and you know it does it does attract a really kind of a special person, and I know that I I really enjoy some of that challenge to overperform and do feats of superhuman strength that normal people can't do. So here's some of the ways that we actually uh, recommend that you can start to really take a look at how to get things done when you've got too much to do and not enough, not enough time or not enough resources to do that. So um, our, last, our last question was, uh, we really talked a lot about delegation. Well, um, the other thing that you, you need to think about is that whatever it is that you are doing that takes that kind of time, um, if you start thinking in a kind of a scaling mentality. How is it that you can make it bigger than yourself or make it bigger than you can grow? Um, is, is that you might take a look at using a project management process to manage your your, your activities, whether it's creating the, um, you know, your annual fundraising campaign or it's executing a, a particular letter, building a website, or if it's um, conducting an event, whatever particular area managing the board that you're um, focused in, it really is helpful to start thinking about a project manager, which helps you delegate gate some of that oversight into a particular project to see it from beginning to the end. And again, a project manager um, is helpful. You can, you can, again, certainly use staff. You can use volunteers. Volunteers are fantastic um, project managers, and it really empowers them to take something, again, strategically from beginning to end, and it builds a good communications process back um, so that you can report and stay on top of what's happening or are informed, but not necessarily responsible for executing or making sure all of the pieces happen in the time frame that they do. Now, 
Um, the other role that a project manager um, helps with and really fulfills that is valuable is that communication process. Oftentimes when you've got people working on a, pro a project, whether they're, you know, you've got to deal with your direct mail house contractor um, or you've got to inform your board president about what's happening with this particular initiative, there's a lot of communication, a lot of coordination that goes on. And that is a big area that really takes a lot of time that we tend to give short shift in our planning and our, in our projections. So a project manager acts as a wonderful um, spearhead and um, controller as far as the communications, making sure that everybody's informed as far as what's happening um, and everything's being on track that's done by that. Now, in order to get... Um, clear whether uh, when you're using project management or you are specifically breaking things down into different tasks and have delegated those out, you want to make sure that you're really, really clear or that your project manager is really, really clear. At some point, you've got to reach real, real hard bound clarity as far as what are the responsibilities um, and what is it that they're doing. So creating even small job descriptions for projects um, and then for those project managers is very, very helpful. And I found, again, that you can delegate that um, because you don't want to be responsible for necessarily conceiving how this is actually going to work. You can delegate that to either the project manager um, or you can do that together in conjunction um, with a couple of how do you see this working and making sure that you're talking about your priorities of what kind of communication do you need to stay on top and who is it that you're informing um, on the other end because that communication path will be a clear part of that um, responsibility there. So um, we really want you to think again in clarity and that is a stumbling block too. I've run into that my own self several times. If I'm talking to somebody I'll have a clear vision of what it is that um, needs to get done and will um, what kind of time frame that needs to happen and I'll, I'll oftentimes um, communicate the goal and the time frame but sometimes people will want to really have a clear understanding if you've got a specific process in mind. So do take that time um, to make sure that you have those conversations. Uh, and again, because the more the more that you can delegate, which is that kind of brain dump moment um, and talking through what are those projects as well as delegating into a project manager really helps make it go faster. So role clarity is going to make um, a big deal. Another, Another thing, thing that... <coughs> excuse me, uh, Heidi. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, particularly with fundraising, the project manager is not necessarily the project leader. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at a, say you're, you're having a fundraising campaign, um, you don't really want to tie up your lead fundraiser as being the project manager for the campaign. They need to be fundraising and that's what they do best. But you can take someone else who's very good at organizing, coordinating, and communicating who can manage the entire campaign and make sure everybody's on the same page, all the communications are going out, everyone knows what's happening when, and your fundraisers can be doing what they do best, which is leading the campaign, while the project manager keeps track of the details and makes sure everybody's informed. That is a great distinction, David, and, and you know we see that. It doesn't have to be staff. We see that also at the volunteer level. Um, it's particularly effective um, um, in a volunteer capacity, you might have a, uh, an honorary chair um, if you're in your fundraising effort who is, um, you know, has the name and has the impetus and is making a lead gift to your, um, to your event or to your, your function. And then um, you might have a chair or co-chair or even a triumvirate of actually working chairs who may not necessarily have the same kind of social uh, capital that the honorary chairs do, but they're they're in there doing the work. So we've got even again at the volunteer level that double um, process there, so that you can do what it is that you're doing best and why why it is that you're fo focused on that. So thank you, David. That's a fantastic example. When we break it down to an individual's um, process as far as how to deal with um, not enough time and too much to do, we've got a, um, a series of some personal time management techniques that have been really 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 helpful. Of course, I'm a big list builder, so um, it doesn't matter what what task it is that needs to get done, but I have found that if I keep a list, and sometimes I get in trouble, I'll have multiple lists going, but make a list. Make a task list. Make a task list for whatever it is that you do. You don't have to remember what needs to get done if it's on your list. Now, the trick to a task list that ties into our next, um, our next component 
is is that what you put on your list is actually not the not a bigger chunk. So it, not, it might be, you know, create the development plan for fiscal year one five, fiscal year fifteen. That's that goes on the task list. That's really a meta task. So um, what you want to do is you want to think in steps. So the first thing I'm going to need to do, you know, in creating a, a meta task like this that would go on my task list, would be to interview or to collect up budgeting information for. Um, fiscal year 15 and to figure out what that is and then it might be to go through and review the history over the last two years of donors um, to make some projections for fiscal year 215. Then it might be to interview um, and recruit some chairs and I might have each in, you know interview of recruiting for chairs of different fundraising activities as a separate task. So when you put your task list together I want you to kind of keep your eye out for if you've got a meta task on there break it down into something smaller. Now the reason that you want to do that is because you're going to do two things. The secret about using lists, and this was um, a really fantastic one that um, uh, Perry Ellis and uh, coaches everywhere are using and I have found it to really decode stuff. Again, you've got too much to do. Everything's urgent. So take a look at your overall task list and you're going to be looking at a specific time frame. So whether you're looking at um, for the week um, or for the day or even for the month. You have a certain time frame that you're going to look at. These things must get done in that time frame. The secret about that task list is that only 20% of those tasks need to get done in that time frame. The rest of it needs to get done, but it's going to actually rotate through and get done at um, a less urgent time frame. So um, the rule of thumb is if you've got a task list of, say, 20 items that have to get done, um, on your on your list, you're going to go through and you're going to find mm, six, maybe maximum, uh, of tasks that have to get done now. You're going to take that 20% and you're actually going to put it on your calendar. You're going to you're going to mark that time with yourself or with the teams that are that you're going to delegate those things to, to actually do those tasks because they are of such urgency. And you're going to protect those time on your calendar just as if you were making out um, a meeting with a donor or a prospect or if you're booking time um, uh, to go to a meeting, that's protected time in order to do that. Um, once you actually get those that 20% that's really important that needs to get done, you don't throw out the rest of your task list. It stays there and you'll find that as you mark off that, the next time you look at that task list, the next 20% are actually coming up and they're coming up in order that they need to get done. You can also go back to it as a bank. Say if you know something wacky happens with the world and you actually finish your stuff before the time allotted, which, right, how often does that happen? But if that does, you've got a bank of stuff that you, um, that you can also go back and reevaluate that in an 80-20%. Uh, Another rule of thumb that is really helpful to use is that once you put that time on your calendar to accomplish that task, really take a thought process of what kind of time is it really going to take. Once you do that, I tend to I find for myself um, that I tend to multiply it by three, and that actually is the the time that it actually takes to get those um, pieces done. So, book only um, a, uh, the time on your calendar, but as you're looking at your calendar, the next thing that you want to do as far as personal time management and making sure that it all gets done is that once you get your 20% on the calendar, you want to take a look at the free time or the open time or the unprogrammed time on your calendar and make sure that you've got about um, one-third of that overall time is booked or planned for. Um, part of being a superhero is being adaptable and being able to, um, to juggle and to pull in, and so you want to be able to have that freedom uh, so that you know when you can handle whatever happens to come into your office or land in your lab. Um, and that you're going to have follow-up and additional things that come in during the week. So build build that time into your calendar. Make sure that that's um, something that you do that. And so that as you're looking at your calendar, if you're booked, you know, 8 hours, 9 hours, 14 hours, sometimes straight through the day with a, an entire and total plan, that tends to be a little bit counterproductive. So think about keeping a rule of thumb as only booking about one-third of the time on your calendar. Now, the other, th other thing, too, again, we're going to just come back. Don't forget to keep time in mind for those unthought through things, the project time management, the communications time, the teaching or the training or the bringing up to speed. So make sure, and that's really helpful in that unprogrammed time, but make sure that you're taking that into account as well. And then, David, I know we had a couple of tools. 
Yeah, um, that would be really helpful. Keeping track of all of this, honestly, one of the, the best tools that we've found and the, the least expensive is Google Docs. Um, it, it allows you to keep a shared calendar so everybody on the team can be working from the same calendar as well as individual calendars, and they have a built in task list. Uh, plus, you can get plugins for uh, Chrome that expand Google Docs and let you have far more elaborate task lists, um, and you can really customize the thing. So that, that's actually a very good tool. Um, One of the ways that I found is really, really helpful in organizing your priorities, as I mentioned, you know, we've got an 80-20 rule. Well, how do you actually really know? We've, we found that this quadrant exercise has been extremely helpful, and I'm going to place in our chat box here the links where you can find some of these um, resources. Dave, you want to walk through what this is? Yeah, this was actually uh, made... Uh, popular by Stephen Covey, but uh, it was developed by President Dwight Eisenhower. Um, and then Covey took it and has, has pretty much made it his own. Uh, it, when you're getting to a point where you need to decide that uh, the 80-20 list, what, what is urgent and important? So you can look at the, the quadrants here. The top, we've got urgency. Is it high urgency or low urgency? And importance, off to the side, we've got low importance and high importance. And Quadrant one is high urgency, high importance. That's your top 20%. Everything else goes in the other three quadrants. And things that are low importance and low urgency, you may want to look at those and see whether you should even be doing that. It, it may be that you've got 20% of the things on your list that just aren't worth doing. Uh, but these can be very, very helpful when you're trying to make those decisions or getting the group to make those decisions and letting getting people to let go of sacred cows. I love quadrant three because, you know, how many times do you have a board member or somebody walk into your office and be all on fire about something that has to get done right now? And being able to um, respond, of course, to that, to their perceived urgency, but I love the someone else's urgent deadline. Knowing the difference between important and urgent is very, very helpful. So that, that also is a, a wonderful thing that you can um, use to evaluate when you when you are bombarded by those kind of uh, perceptions of people coming through your door and asking for a million things. Yep, you'll look much stronger. <laughs> so, speaking of strengths. <laughs> strengths, huh? <laughs> strengths, strengths. Oh my, that's one big old <laughs> spider web, David. <laughs> Jeez, geez, that's entire, wow. Yeah, what, I'm, I would be afraid to see if, how big the spider was that made that. I mean, it seems like something out of the Hobbit, like maybe Shelob, right? Or oh, yeah, you would think yeah. it's huge. I mean, that that is one big, big, big spider web. Um, okay, yeah. So I'm going to ask the question. So, so it's a big spider. I'm happy to not necessarily be where this particular spider is, but what does this have to do with fundraising? Strength. Uh, this little spider is actually not big. Uh, it, it's a Darwin's bark spider. Um, and it weaves uh, the biggest webs that you will find of any spider on Earth. Uh, they weave them over bodies of water to catch insects flying up and down creeks uh, and rivers. Um, and they can anchor their threads up to 25 meters across. That's 82 feet. <laughs> That's how big around this thing is. 82 feet in diameter is, is it how big they can make them. Uh, it really is from and, the Hobbit. So anything that touches that, um, and, and you know, if it's going to be that big, it, it has to be sturdy. Um, so they tested the, uh, the threads that this thing spins, and it's 10 times stronger than Kevlar. So it takes an incredible amount of energy from a, a bug flying to, uh, to break this thing. Incredibly strong. So they have huge strength, and that's what it uses to... Uh, to feed itself. So playing to your personal strengths is, is core to this spider. He's able to create strong webs and it's key to our next question. And Lucinda M asks, uh, let's see, I'm an experienced fundraiser. Okay, both as a staff and a volunteer. Recently joined a new organization. Good for you, Lucinda. Congratulations. And what can I do to really shine with my fundraising? Okay. I love that moment when you take on everything's new and fresh and shiny and you're really going to kick it out, kick out the jams at a new place and uh, get some good traction before everything really starts to get difficult. So it's a great time, Lucinda. We've got some good tools. 
So efficiency is an important piece, um, and I know David, you've really done a lot of oops, you've done a lot of um, thinking through different um, components. So what we've got um, here, as far as one of the things that I really use when I'm coming into a new project, um, or if I'm working as a consultant, even if I'm taking on multiple projects, um, is that especially as an experienced fundraiser, um, Lucinda, you will have. Um, the understanding of how do you actually plan and execute on a campaign basis. And what's interesting is that whole entire almost project plan that happens on um, your campaign, all of those different components go into making um, the different pieces of your fundraising really spectacular and really special. So if you look at it as far as managing a campaign, so you've got a communication component where you're going to be really um, focused on techniques that are motivating and informing and creating urgency. And those specific techniques are going to be the individual interviews and discussions and face-to-face -face chats that you have, not necessarily only with donors, but you're going to have those with staff and with volunteers and with board members and leaders. So that is a, a, you know, a key component of starting to build that uh, momentum. So manage it like a campaign with communication. The next thing, again, thinking about the urgency, because, again, one of the communications techniques that we use in campaigns um, is why they need to do whatever it is that we're asking them to do now. Why now and not later? Why do we need to take action now? What is that next specific action step? And oftentimes, no matter what meeting or what communication that I'm having, whether it be with staff, a volunteer, a board member, or with a donor, you always have that call to action or that next step in mind and that you're laying that out. So there's a clear, um, in that communication process, a clear next step for everybody involved. Um, and it helps people feel um, feel secure knowing that, one, what's expected, and two, what, what's the time frame that they need to, to be doing that, which gives them that urgency. Okay, I've got to get this done. So some of the, the tools that I've used to do that are email updates, of course. I've used them in a newsy way. So you might be chatty. You might be talking about something interesting that's been happening or something interesting that you learned. Um, of course, congratulatory. So recognizing um, the people who are involved and congratulating them on what it is that they're doing. Other tools that um, are very, very um, essential to managing um, your project as if you were managing a campaign are shared calendars. Um, we've got all kinds of great ways to share calendars on a group basis or in a kind of a crowd sh uh, crowd um, crowd space or on the cloud so that everybody knows what's coming up. And again, those dates and putting things on the calendar is a great way to create those urgencies, which is essential for moving things forward. Um, you can use hard newsletters. They have not died. Um, direct mail is not dead, but using actual printed newsletters is also a great communications tool that reaches out. If you're again, um, if you're managing a large region um, that um, not necessarily everybody's um, tuned in on the on the e sphere, that's a really particularly helpful one. Another thing that I um, would recommend that you do is again using thinking about the communications techniques is that you're going to specifically schedule check-in appointments um, and this and you don't necessarily have to tell them that it's a hey I'm scheduling a check-in appointment with you but you're scheduling specific time to take temperature um, and to g gather feedback um, and to again spend time on engagement so um, having those coffee meetings with board members um, or even with staff members coffee meeting with um, volunteers again just to see what's on the mind and see how things are going and to um, share a little thing a uh, bit about what it is that you're working on or are some of the questions that you may have so specifically check-in appointments are great communications tools um, when you gather people together don't forget um, again a, a component of campaign management is creating those larger progress or update reports so you're going to be pulling more statistical information or volume information together um, and then really distributing that, but then walking that through, walking through that with people so that they understand those numbers and what it is that they mean to them on a personal basis. So, um, and once you get them in that rhythm of what it is that they're looking at, um, then having those available on a regular basis um, is really, really helpful, whether you're using them at a board meeting or a committee meeting, or if you've got them in shared space and you just update them every week and you send an email, hey guys, this is the latest news, this is what's happened, it's been a great week, come take a look. Um, Believe it or not, um, we all know about the thermometers. You know, you're measuring your campaign goal. That's a wonderful um, communications tool that you can use for other things other than watching the dollars or the money come in. Um, but measure actual um, 
progress towards what it is that you're doing. So um, it gives you, it's almost like an infographic. It gives you a kind of a very quick and dirty um, way of communicating progress. And again, helping people um, translate that and create that urgency and put that on board. Another thing that's going to really make you shine, um, and I know that you know this is a, a seasoned fundraiser, is that the more that you can um, share the spotlight or the more that you can um, really point up what people are doing um, with public celebrations, that's going to be, um, again, a great way to really get people excited about um, the new work that you're doing and really pulling things together. So um, the more public celebrations that you can have, even if it's just a momentary um, congratulations um with a photo on your blog or a photo on, on the organization's webpage, great way to celebrate and to point up um, the good work that people are doing uh, together, as well as benchmarks that you're making, um, whether it's in your program development or with your organization or if you're with your campaign. Public celebrations are fantastic. And of course, um, working with different um, benchmarks. So um, again, thinking in that process as far as campaign management, if you roll it into all of the things that you can do to communicate um, and you put some of the urgency and the time frame on it, that's going to really make some of your, make your efforts shine and really set you up for some great success by really getting some good engagement. Now, David, I know that you're an expert at a bunch of different ways because you manage large-scale communications on how do you actually manage that? What are some of the tools that can make you as an individual more efficient in getting that done? Well, Heidi, um, when we manage campaigns, uh, we, we were talking earlier about using a calendar and a shared calendar. Uh, we found it can be daunting to try and plan out a campaign using uh, an actual electronic calendar. And an, an easier and faster way to do that is to simply use a spreadsheet and a shared spreadsheet for everybody on the team. And you set it up so that rather than having specific dates, which can seem frightening and constricting, you set it up as week one, seven days, week two, seven days, week three, seven days, and just move down your spreadsheet like that all the way to the, the culmination of your campaign. And you mark off on each day what has to happen on each day. Use a separate tab for the, the same kind of calendar for communications, what communications go out each day, what channels are they used, so your, your whole social media campaign is on there, your direct mail campaign, your email campaign. Those are all listed on the communications spreadsheet. And then um, finally, you've got a, a, a sheet that explains what the content of each of the communications are and what you're trying to accomplish with them. Then that can all be mapped on the shared calendar in, in Google Docs uh, so that people can refer back to the spreadsheet for details and you don't have your calendar all bunched up with all that information on it. It also mm -hmm. lets you come back next year when you want to run a campaign again and it's all listed out as week one, two, three, and you don't have specific dates, so it's much easier to update. Great. Now, we've also collected, a, um, in our experience, several, I mean, there's apps out there that can help you. We've got a good selection of things that we've used um, and have it encountered. Tell us a little bit about these guys. Yeah, um, these are efficiency tools. We, we already talked about Google Docs. We love it. Um, Basecamp uh, and the guys at 37 Signals who make that have a whole series of tools that are a little beefier than Google Docs. So if Google Docs isn't cutting it for you anymore, you might look at 37 Signals and, and some of their products, uh, Basecamp, Backpack, and so forth. Asana is uh, a great project management platform. Uh, we use it a lot. Uh, you can use uh, Microsoft Project. There are a bunch of apps out there that you can get as plugins for any of the other tools you're using. Uh, MailChimp is terrific for managing email campaigns, and it's got a lot of hooks in its API so it can tie back into things like uh, Google Docs or your WordPress site. Um, Squarespace is another way to, to manage building your website. We like that one a lot. It allows you to build a website without knowing uh, any coding. And it's not locked in on Squarespace's platform either. It's something where you can export the whole site and take it to a different host if you like. WordPress is probably the best way on earth that we've found to build uh, a website that would suit almost any nonprofit organization. It's got all the plugins you could possibly want. Uh, it's what we use to, to power our site underneath it. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of plugins with it to, to help with the store and so forth. Uh, Post Planner is a, a great uh, 
application that we found to help you. Uh, it allows you to set up and pre-program all of your uh, uh, Facebook work for the day. And it, it helps you with uh, ideas of things you can post. Um, you can tie feeds into it from uh, where you get all the information you want to talk about with your, your donors. Really nice one. Hootsuite does that too to some extent. Um, it's a little wider in that it hits uh, a lot of the social media platforms, uh, but it's not quite as helpful as Post Planner. So a combination of the two could be really nice. Great. So from project management to communications, um, look look to some of the productivity apps. They're really really quite helpful, easy to use, and they oftentimes have free versions. So, um, again, you've got a big job to be fabulous, so go for it. What's next? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, dung beetles. All right. Well, you know, I actually encountered these in South Africa, and um, they're really quite industrious um, folks. Actually, one of them was pushing one of the balls of dung and the other one happened to be riding it seems to be going for a spin it was kind of funny so what does these have to do with fundraising superheroes dung beetles yes they are superheroes these are the strongest critter on the whole planet uh dung beetle can pull 1140 times its own body weight that that is super cool they were also um worshipped in ancient egypt here we've got a, a dung beetle statue uh so scarabs and dung beetles, um, huge, hugely popular in, in, in Egypt. Uh, but so dung beetle, um, you saw him pushing that giant ball. So just like Sisyphus, these guys have strength and like Sisyphus was pushing the giant ball up the hill his entire life. Dung beetles can do the same thing and they're incredibly powerful. So that brings us to Edmund B's question, who asks, every year we're handed down a fundraising goal from the budgeting committee. <laughs> Yes, the Sisyphean, <laughs> Sisyphean goal. How can mm -hmm. we make the goal manageable, and how do I translate that into my personal goals? Oh, excellent, Edmund. Well, I certainly do understand the Sisyphean uh, reference then, and I hope you certainly don't feel like a dung beetle then pushing that uh, ball of poop up the hill. However, because it happens over and over again, um, the easiest thing that you want to do is for, when you're handed um, something like that is that you're going to actually break it down. Um, and oftentimes it depends upon the role that you're filling. So if you are on the organizational basis, if you're a member of the budgeting committee, remember it's a two-way street. So um, goals, even if it comes to you kind of as a package and you're kind of it's dumped on you and you've got to figure out how to make it done, remember it's going to have sub-goals. So take that, break it down, look at what the sub-goals are that add up to the big goal by project or activity or funding source. Those are two different ways that you can break it down. Now, going through that process is also going to show you what really is and is not reasonable and opens those lines of communication. So that's going to let you, if you can break it down into different sub-goals, it's also going to let you fiddle with those different sub-goals and see if you can make up some of that space of what um, needs to be done with a different sub-goal. So, so when you're putting those um, sub goals together. Again, you're even going to break those down. You're going to look at um, some of the variables. You're going to look at the funding purpose, right? Because now you can start looking at project specific funding. That's one way to break it down. You're going to look at access to donors. You're going to look at previous giving and potential activities. So the more that you can break things into different components, that's going to help you help you out. Now, so that's an organizational process of taking a, a larger goal and breaking it down. Now, if you happen to be a leader. If you're um, on the board or you're leading a, a charge or a staff leader, um, you're going to take that overall strategy and then turn it into a personal component. Um, you as the leader, your leader, your job is to inspire, to motivate, and delegate, right? Um, so break that down for you into what is what are the steps that you need to um, accomplish. And remember that main component is in engagement, empowerment, and inspiring of others. So put it through that lens as a leader. If you're, t if you're on the team, um, your goals are going to come to you already broken down a level. You'll have a sub-goal as the team member. Now, each team leader, who is also maybe a project manager, um, they can track those different sub-goals and use that again to motivate team members. And they might even break that sub-goal down even farther into subcommittees or individuals. Now, if you're working at um, taking a goal and breaking it down as an individual, remember your biggest responsibility and almost your biggest pitfall is going to be time management. So you're going to put your fundraising activities, the actions that you're going to do um, that actually lead into a, your particular goal, 
um, on the calendar and make sure that there's a straight line to those results. Um, you want to so it has to do with more timing and um, cash flow that you can actually project that out. And a personal fundraising plan that identifies what activity and each activity's goal, along with your personal steps or interactions, will keep you from wasting time. Now, we get that question a lot as far as what do we do and how are we strategically doing this? Because, you know, there's also that political component of, of reaching that goal when it's handed down to you every year. And so what we've got, too, you might be interested in taking a look at is the, our nonprofit treasure map, which is a really super easy to follow strategic process that helps you cut through all of the questions about what's going to actually work and then really helps you dial in on what are your priorities or what's going to turn um, the most effective components for you at an organizational level and a personal level in your overall planning. So if you're interested, take a look at the, uh, the tr uh, nonprofit treasure map. It's a pretty great tool that you can use for both organizations and individuals. What's coming up next, David? Here we go. Uh huh. Yeah, that looks like super beast, right? Yeah, it doesn't look very super at all. It's uh, from the Planaridae family. It's a planarian. Uh, it's a, actually a harmless flatworm, and it lives in the water uh, all over the world. But don't dismiss it because it does, in fact, have superpowers. You can slice and dice one of these things up into as many pieces as you like, as small as you like, in any direction you like, and each piece will regenerate back into a full-size flatworm. <laughs> All the way down to a single cell level. So if you could break this guy apart one cell at a time, you would end up with that many flatworms. That's just amazing. It just kills me that they can do that. Wow. E even cooler, wow. even cooler, they've taught these things how to uh, recognize light because uh, they're, they're, they don't like light and they've trained some to like light and, and to recognize it and they were able to cut them up and the new ones that are generated remembered what they had learned about light. Ooh. That is superpower. Brings us to our next question. Um, let's see. Cloning yourself, yes, that would be a good thing to do. How uh, Peter R. asks, how do I balance being out fundraising with all the other stuff that has to happen? So, Oh, yeah. Great, great question, Peter, and, and one that we deal with on an individual basis in fundraising all the time. Um, even if we would love to clone ourselves, it's probably not going to solve the problem. So what you need to know um, is that there's going to be two different types of people on your effective fundraising team, or you're going to have a split personality. Um, and you want to know what personality you need to be engaging with at the particular time that you're doing with it. But we put them in these two different categories, hunters and farmers. Now, your hunters are, are those that go out, they hunt, they bring back the meat, they bring back the food, the sustenance for the group, and that's their function. The farmers um, are the ones that stay in one place, and they take care of the home place and make sure that there are great facilities to attract and to bring um, food and sustenance into um, into the community. So these two different um, mindsets or these two different functions are going to help you really specifically divide up your time. So when you think about um, whether you know being out in the community, you're acting as a hunter. Your purpose is to be out, to be cultivating, to bringing back, to be identifying, to building new stuff. So um, know the difference between hunters and farmers. If you're managing a fundraising office, I want you to make sure that um, you are putting your hunters out in the community. Do not put your farmers in the community. That will be a long waste of time. And um, if you're trying to um, balance your activity with your return on investment, make sure that the more hunters that you have deployed, they're sometimes a little bit harder to find than farmers. Make sure that they're actually um, uh, you're deploying the right people. These again can be volunteers or staff members. And then um, make sure that your communications um, process. You know, we talked a lot about those communications um, tasks and the time that it takes to do that. Those are great farmer activities. So think about think about dividing up your time um, like that, or dividing up your team like that with those two particular characteristics. Now, make sure also in managing your fundraising office between the time it is to be out. Um, build in your operations time and put the resources behind it. Um, so team management is a resource. Operations management is a resource. Your systems management, so all of those infrastructure components, assign a farmer to those particular pieces. Those are great things for them to do, and they're essential for making sure that you're freeing up 
um, your hunters to be able to do that. Again, same thing at the staff. Make sure your, your hunters on, on staff are doing direct contact fundraising and your farmers are in the office. And volunteer. Volunteers fall into the same hunters and farmers um, category. So um, just make sure that when you're identifying or talking to your volunteers, you know which ones are which. If you've got project management volunteers, help them break down the goals. Again, they're great. They're greatest farmers. Um, make sure that you're concentrating that time and really valuing both of those um, pieces and building up those additional structures. So um, board management and time of volunteers is also um, really helpful. But working in an office is just one place for you and your staff or you and your team to do the great things that you do. One of the secret codes that we've got um, is about your environment. So if you actually bring people into your office, mm -hmm. what is this, David? This this is our bonus, bringing people into your office, uh, that your office is more than just a place to hang out. It's a place that can be part of your fundraising process. So you have to show how special your office is, and it's good for doing uh, tours to tell your organization's story. So just like these raptors chose a very exotic place for their nest, it's far more exciting than your average raptor nest. Uh, take a look around your office and see what you can do to make your place more exciting and tell your story. Uh, yes, well, you know, my background in theater, I would take a look at, at your office or your organization or your site as a stage, and that set design is important. So think about the flow. Um, you know, you can be killing two birds with one stone while you're actually doing the work. Or if you've got farmers at work, you know, bring people in um, to the office. If you think about, like, kind of like the spider said to the fly, right? Come into my lair. Um, it's the same kind of thing. So think about the flow. While you're focused on the nuts and bolts and goals and your benchmarks, it's really about the experience that you're providing with donors and prospects. So we expect, we, you know, we really encourage you to use a special kind of flow with your donors. Think about it as fun shui. Yay. <laughs> Blah. <laughs> yep. So we're, we're working on the experience. Okay. And I know we're running short on time here. So I do want to take a pause now. Um, if you um, think about the questions that you have, go ahead and submit those. We're moving into our questions. Um, we'll take a moment. If we don't get your question today, we'll certainly um, tack that on on a different um, component. And um, love, love, love to have you um, do that. So if uh, we're going to be hanging out for a few more minutes just answering a couple of questions, and then we'll do a couple of things that we can help you wrap up. So we've got a quick question here um, from Barbara. Um, Barbara's asking, how can I get my board members to be more comfortable f with fundraising? Great management question. Okay, um, so just um, a couple of things to really take, take in mind is to um, think about, again, your ongoing communications. Make sure that you are making friends and talking about stuff other than what they're not doing in fundraising or what's coming up next in fundraising, but actually taking that moment to, to, to really chat with them. Next thing that you can do to make board members more comfortable with fundraising is, of course, that, that part of that is getting comfortable with you because you'll be looked at as the kind of the wicked person that's coming to beat them over the head with a task. So uh, make friends uh, and build out the time to do that and uh, make sure that you're doing that on a regular basis. Next thing that you want to do is make the tasks, tasks, not strategy, but bite-sized tasks, small things. That's really um, helpful for volunteers and board members to get excited. And make sure that um, when when you're working with them, you might be talking about them on a, talking with them on an individual basis. Start with something small, something that they can accomplish, and make sure that you really celebrate that um, publicly. And then the last thing, of course, when it comes to helping your board members be more comfortable with fundraising, is managing your management time. Right? Don't forget to build in that extra communications and training time. Now, I found um, too um, when I was working uh, as the chief development officer and managing staff is that I spent an inordinate amount of time um, training board members simply because they have a rotating schedule and there's always new activities coming in. So one of the things that we've put together to really help you if you're interested is we've, that's, that was the basis of us building the entire Ask Master series. So um, you can actually sit your volunteers or your board members or whoever you need to train down with the series. I mean, it gives them very individual tools um, and it helps them think through that process of what it is that they're doing so that you don't have to necessarily do that. You want to think about scaling in training. So um, you can actually empower and train other people to do that training for you so that you're not the one that has to do all of that communications too. So think about tools in scaling um, when you're thinking about different ways to, to do that. 
Okay, now we're really tight on time, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. If we didn't get your, I see we've got a good um, scale of uh, questions coming in, so we'll certainly get to them in our next session. Um, Again, uh, mark your calendar. The next session is coming on October 22nd for the Master Circle. Make sure you keep your eye on your email. So coming after this session will be um, instructions to how will you access, if we get the recording, um, how you will access that recording um, and um, how you can sign up for that next, um, next one. Now, don't forget, make sure that you mark in your calendar. You did earn credit here today, so we're excited for you um, on that one. Lovely, lovely, lovely to have you um, here for that. And then... We need your help. We specifically need your help because I want you to hang tight. One is that we've got a survey coming up. Again, remember the um, Master Circle is all about what it is that you need to do. So if you sit tight, um, at the t at, on your screen is going to pop up a survey where you're going to get to vote on next session's topic. So take a look. Um, let us know what it is that you want to know about, and um, we will let you know the results of the vote um, in, a, in the follow-up email. Another thing, too, if you've got a specific idea or question or concern, challenge that you're facing, submit a question. Let us know what kind of topics that you do want to cover. That would really, really help us, again, craft this to make sure that you get the information that you need. Now, we've also got some additional resources for you. Stop by. Sign up for our blog. You can get that delivered directly to you if you sign up for the feed. Or you can just come by and visit the blog. It's a great place. So I've st stuck those um, URLs for you there in the, in the question box there for you. It's been great having you here today. We've loved mm -hmm. talking about your superhero uh, processes. So thank you, David. It's been great. My pleasure, Heidi. Thanks, folks. And we want you to stay in touch. So don't forget to uh, hang out with us and what's going on in the social media space. We do kind of wacky stuff occasionally there. So let us know what's going on in your shop. And we will catch you on the flip side. It's time to rock on. I know you've got your secret cape stashed away, so it's time to put it back on and go save the world. Yay! We'll catch you <laughs> on the flip side, guys. Thanks. Hang tight for their survey.